Thank you, Kelly. Glad to be here. I'm a big supporter of uh, Farm Bureau. I appreciate such a good crowd here. I, I hate it when I drive 11 hours to get there and there's four people, including me. But uh, got a nice crowd here. Enjoy you, uh, you guys being here. Seen a lot of friends and old faces. Uh, spent a lot of my time here in, in Missouri and, and very proud of that. My roots are from Missouri before I ever hit the ground. And uh, I just, uh, I think this is a very integral state, and when I spent so much time working in it, I would describe it as each corner of Missouri seems to be in a whole different geographical part of the nation. You know, if I'm in Joplin, might as well be in Oklahoma City. You know, if, if I'm in St. Joe, uh, I feel like I'm in Iowa or Nebraska, and uh, you go out to Hannibal and you feel like you're in the Eastern Corn Belt, and uh, you know, the Boot Hill might as well be somewhere down in Alabama or something, right? And, that, and, uh, and it's a very diverse place. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad that I was able to spend so much time there. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the condition of the cattle market. I'm going to visit quite a bit about uh, what we just talked about. I've been told that I'm pretty good at dumbing things down. And I'll tell you, that's because of necessity. And uh, so I, I do that quite a bit. But uh, I also like to preface my uh, presentation saying that I, I apologize to those that I'm about to offend. Uh, give me a little background on myself. Like I said, my roots are in Missouri. My, my great grandfather, and this is a picture I'm very proud of, that's a fourth generation picture. Uh, my great grandfather on the far left, he grew up in Missouri, he was, uh, grew up near Iberia. And uh, he farmed with uh, horses and mules, and he despised it. And uh, and he told me that he he was he was still living. Uh, he was he was a very unique guy. He he uh, he wheeled and dealed and did a lot of things. He lived a full life. His his uh, funeral was on his 100th birthday. Wow. So that's a, that was a full life. You're not really sad on that. You just celebrate the life that he had. But uh, he hate, he hated farming. He, uh, he started his cattle career drive, riding a horse and a dog down the lane as far as he thought he could go, and then he would come back and buy, you know, whatever cattle a guy had for sale, whether it was a calf or an old bull or a cow or two, and then he would start driving them towards the railhead, and, and eventually he would send them into East St. Louis to the stockyards. He had a brother that worked for a commission firm there, and he would sort those cattle up and sell them, and he made a good living doing that. But he, he, he strived for bigger areas and more cattle, and so he moved to western Nebraska, spent a lot of his life living in, in Binkelman, Nebraska, buying cattle up and down the, the eastern ugly side of Colorado, and uh, finally retired down in southeastern Colorado. But uh, this is a picture of him uh, buying strings of cattle out in eastern Colorado after they, they, they finally got straight trucks where you didn't have to drive them to the railhead all the time. So that, that's an interesting picture of uh, him. His name was Willard Wall, and he, uh, he, was a, he was one of those guys that was rich and poor several times in his life. You guys remember those old guys like that? And uh, he told me when I was about, and it may have been this trip when we went and seen him, I was about 17 or so, he told me he thought I was coming of age, and he said, you know, he said, I don't know what you do, but he said, from the time I was younger than you, I was just a teenager. From, from then, from up until I was in my middle 80s, he said, every single day, I drank at least a pint of whiskey. He said, I smoked a whole can of Prince Albert and I chew a full plug of tobacco every single day. He said, it never bothered me too much, but I don't think a guy would want to get hooked on. <laughs> <laughs> so then my, this is my granddad. Uh, his, his son, my granddad, when he got back from World War II, he wanted to be in the cattle business. So uh, he was an auctioneer and he sold uh, some auctions. Country auctions were starting to be a, a more normal thing in the late 40s and early 50s. And uh, he, got, he got some money together and decided that uh, he wanted to build a sale barn in Clayton, New Mexico, which is extreme northeastern New Mexico. And this was, uh, this was opening day. Uh, I think it was in 1949. This is the opening day. This is him auctioneering, and he had some fancy Herefords in there that day. But uh, 
He thought that Clayton was the best place in the world to build a sail barn. He built the spur off the railroad so he could load and unload cattle off the, off the train there. Uh, every time I think about him saying that this was the best place in the world to have a sail barn, I look at this bottom right picture, and as far as you can see out there, there's no grass, no water, and no cattle. <laughs> So I wondered about whether that was the best place in the world to build a cell farm, but that's what he did. Uh, I come down to my, my dad, and uh, in the way we grew up, my dad was a cell farm trader, which is a dirty word. You don't dare say that anymore. But that's the way that he fed us and kept sh shoes on our feet. He went to six cells a week. He bought whatever looked cheap and, and thought he had a place where he could sell it higher. Uh, but, uh, if you look at that top right uh, picture up there, uh, that, that was his trader rig back in the 60s. And, and that, today that would be like what a King Ranch uh, one-ton doodle with aluminum gooseneck. But uh, that was his trader rig, and he thought he did the big time when he got that old rig there where he could, he could pin hook cattle from one cell barn to the other. But uh, he was an auctioneer. Uh, we had our own cell barn in New Mexico for a few years at a different location. Uh, I auctioneered it, and I went on to do that, but uh, mostly I spent uh, uh, those years going to college, and then uh, his health started failing about the time I was ready to do something, so uh, when all my buddies got out of college and, and they got a ranch, I, I got out of college and I got a job. <laughs> so I went to work for USDA, and I spent almost 20 years working for USDA. He was talking about mandatory price reporting. I was transferred to St. Joe, Missouri to work in mandatory price reporting. I hated it. It was the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. I was chained to a desk. I looked at, at uh, data reports where the package was put stuff in. And it wasn't very long after that and I got the opportunity to run the Missouri uh, Federal State Program that reports the sale barns and the grain markets and I jumped at that. Enjoyed doing that for many years. But I want to go back to the early days. These are the stockyards. Uh, back in the, in the day, people marketed their cattle at a slaughter weight. A lot of them weren't grain fed, they were just grass fed. Most of them were three years old or older, but they were at a slaughter weight, not necessarily finished and not necessarily grain fed, but they were at a slaughter weight. So they, they bring those cattle into a stockyard and sell them here. Back in those days, everybody kept their cattle, their calves, until they were at a slaughter weight. You didn't sell calves and yearlings. You, you finished your cattle out. So this is an old uh, stockyard, uh, Kansas City. And if you look over here on this left-hand side, I apologize to you guys on that side of the room, but uh, this is where the, the finished cattle were sold, fed cattle, fat cattle. Over here was your feeder alley. You were a second-class citizen if you were over in the feeder alley. That's kind of the other way around. All the actions in the calf and the yearling markets, right? Well, you consigned your cattle to the stockyards. You consigned them to a commission firm, and the commission uh, agents would bring your cattle in, uh, merchandise them, get them weighed up, put in these pens, similar to the way a cell barn does. But they didn't have options at that time. Uh, they, they sold the cattle in the alleys on the bricks, so they used to say, because most of the alleyways were made out of bricks back in those days. But, uh, so, they, uh, you sold your cattle on the bricks, and, and your commission agents haggled over the price with the packers. Unbelievable how they used to do that. Without technology and things like that, they would haggle over things. So they, they had them and tried to get the best price for you. Back in these days, 100% of the cattle sold in a negotiated manner. And, uh, and so this is how they sold. They had rules back in those days. They had packers and stockyards. You've heard this week that PNS is going to turn up the enforcement of the rules uh, on, your, on your cattle trades. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that's when PNS had some teeth. They had Packers and stockyards, agents at the stockyards, they were out there in the middle of all these guys. They were making sure everything was on the up and up. They, you didn't just go in there willy-nilly. They had rules. They had 9 o'clock, so the guys are getting the cattle merchandise and weighed up and put the pins. Your packers just couldn't jump in there and play favorites. No. Say at 9 o'clock in the morning, your packer buyers could enter the yards. I mean, did you run to your buddy? 
uh, the guy that you formulated cattle with or promised like no. They put all the different commission firms in a hat and the pack of buyers would draw a name. After that, they had a rotation. So if you bought, if you, you picked it up, you had the Corn Belt Commission Company, that's where you started. So it kept people from playing favorites, kept people from promising cattle to the packers. All the stuff that we have problems with now, they did it with a simple throw the names in the hat and draw them out. So, so you, had to, you had to start coming to your milk. Maybe you didn't wasn't best friends with Corn Belt Commission Company. But you knew if you wanted to buy some cattle, you better start negotiating because at the time you, you got around the circuit to the, your buddies, they might have been sold out by then. It was a good way to do it. we got to have some measures now to, to kind of keep tabs on things. Uh, in the late 60s, you saw that uh, a lot of your cattle feeding left the Midwest and went to more dry, dry arid type of climates, western Kansas, Texas Panhandle, where I live now and uh, where I, I grew up as a, as a high schooler and college boy. But uh, the, uh, the, they went out here on the slope, if they could find one, they found that it was more efficient to feed cattle in these conditions than it was to fight the mud all the time in the cold weather. And so even though we didn't have a lot of feed down there, uh, you know, you could haul feed and haul cattle to a central point with grails and, and you could efficiently feed cattle right there. So then the packers, left the stockyard areas. You know, you go back to Kansas City and St. Joe and Omaha and all the places like that. All the packers were right around the stockyard because that's where all the cattle were. Or whenever they moved the cattle feeding, the packers followed. And so they come out here. At that point, we lost enforcement of PNS regulation because your PNS agents weren't right there. They were still drinking coffee in the greasy spoon in the exchange buildings where there was nothing going on. And they didn't go out to, to oversee what was going on. So they got out here. At this time, you started seeing packers investing in these feeding operations, owning feeder cattle and feeding them themselves, and starting to get into sweetheart deals uh, with, with the cattle feeders. I want to go back to the early 1900s. I hope you guys can appreciate these cartoons. These political cartoons were some of the most popular cartoons of their time. This is back in Teddy Roosevelt days. This was back whenever they published the book, The Jungle, if you guys remember that. It talked about the horrible conditions in the packing houses and the way that they treated their employees and all that kind of thing. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a great American president, probably as great as any one as the one we had just the last time. But uh, he, 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 he tried everything. He did everything. He lived a full life. Well, one thing that he saw, even though he loved the free market uh, democracy that we had, he knew that it didn't work if you had monopolies. So he broke up all the big monopolies, whether it was steel, uh, food, railroads, whatever it was. He broke them up. But probably one of the biggest ones that he broke up uh, was called the Beef Trust where he saw that you had six packers that had 50% control of your beef business. You guys are thinking, I'd dance naked in the streets if we had six packers controlling only 50% of the beef. So right now we've got four packers controlling about 85%, at least on your steering heifers, right? So, so he, he took that on, and you saw what, what a stinky mess it was that he took on. And then you saw this big... Uh, Brutus of a, of a butcher there, and that was representing the Beast Trust itself. The thing that, that I like about these cartoons the best is that these cartoons were some of the most popular of that time. Can you guys imagine a political cartoon about the cattle business or the beef business being in Wall Street Journal or USA Today or something like that? Nobody cares anymore, do they? It's, it, and why is that? It's been too long since people have been hungry. And nobody understands it. It's a true fact that the majority of your elementary school children in your inner cities cannot draw a line from a pig to a piece of bacon or a cow to a hamburger. They, they, they have no fathom of that. They, they don't understand it at all. And a lot of your, your, uh, uh, your mid, young and middle-aged people don't either. Why is that? Because it's, we're, we're too far removed from the farm. 
40 or 50 years ago, everybody had an uncle or a grandpa or somebody that had a farm. And a lot of times they would spend a couple of weeks in the summer or something going there and learning where their food comes from. Nobody has that anymore. And so it's not important to them anymore, and we're not going to see uh, our industry come into public view very often. I'm showing you this, which I know it's busy, and, and I know some of you can't see it, and that's okay. This is a, a purchase type breakdown of how you sell fat cattle, finished cattle out of your feedlots. Uh, the top one is your five area feeding region, uh, the middle one is Texas, and the, and the bottom one is Nebraska. But the four, there's four different ways you can sell cattle, uh, finished cattle out of the feedlot. Negotiated cash, like we, we've talked a lot about negotiating. The only way I can describe negotiated is, is if you guys watch the American Pickers on the History Channel, anybody do that? The guy's walking through a guy's basement and he sees something that he likes and all of a sudden that piece of junk becomes very important to the guy that owns it. <laughs> and he, he blows the dust off of it and then they start negotiating back and forth. What do you give me? What do you take? That's negotiating. You think everything should be sold in that manner. No. But negotiated cash, formula, what is a formula? Uh, that's a series of premiums and discounts off the cattle's performance, but in most cases, it still goes back to a base price that, that's, uh, that's brought about by negotiated cash. Forward contracting is pretty self-explanatory. Forward contracting is a, is a big way to sell feeder cattle, not so much fat cattle. Negotiated grid is just what it is. I think it's the second best way to sell cattle because there's negotiation. But the cattle are, are uh, sold off of their performance, but the base price is negotiated upon other than just given out on a report somewhere. So you look at this and you think, well, okay, back in, uh, in 2005, when there were mandatory price reporting that had been around long enough that it started to get pretty trustworthy, we saw that uh, there was 47% of the cattle in Texas sold to negotiated cash. In your five area, about 56% of the cattle were still sold negotiated cash. When I got out of college and went to work for USDA Market News, almost 100% of the cattle were sold negotiated cash, and that was in 1996. Man, it was fading pretty fast then. I started out in the Amarillo office. We called feedlots every day. We had four sheets of them, and then they were single spaced, and we called feedlots all day long, every day trying to find when the trade started, at what level they were, where the bids were at, and all that. I found out that uh, when I got there, that there was four sheets, and I thought they were just a gate cut. But the, the fourth sheet went to the little guy in the office, and it was filled with all the assholes that wouldn't talk to you. <laughs> they called them, and they were, as soon as you said USDA, they were already red-faced mad. And so it kind of went downhill from there. But uh, that's the way you cut your teeth with USDA market news. But uh, so, so they had, like I said, 1996, we used to sell 100,000 head of fat cattle out of your feedlots every week. Negotiated. Every week, every week, every week. Now, where the trade started, where it ended, you know, who knows. But it was 100,000 in Texas, 100,000 in Kansas, 100,000 in Nebraska. Iowa was a little short of that, Kansas was too, but it always come up around 400,000 head. Well, Texas, uh, they had slipped by 2005, but just, just under half of the cattle out of the feedlots were sold negotiated cash. And you watched it dwindle, and you watched it dwindle, and you watched it dwindle, and we come to the big market crash after the big highs in 2014, 2.6% of the cattle in the Texas panhandle were sold negotiated cash. Does that make you feel good? Now, I'm not a mathematician, but that's, that's a, in, in loose math, that means 97.4% of the cattle were sold off of what 2.6% brought. Do you think there's any opportunity for manipulation there? So even though I'm from Texas and proud of it, I don't know how big of a wheeler dealers we really are. <laughs> Look at these pie charts, it gives you a better idea. In 2005, this, uh, this blue or purple side of the, of the chart here was negotiated cash. We 
felt like we had some price discovery there, right? By the time we got to 2018, and then confidentiality started getting too hard to pick up what was going on, the big orange Pac-Man called Formula had almost gobbled up all the other ways to sell cattle. Look at this chart right here. Look at your formula-fed cattle sales. Formula-fed cattle sales. You look at the black mark, which is Texas. You look at the, at the red, which is Kansas. They went from, like I said earlier, around 40%, just under half. They just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Now, in the other areas, in the northern plains, uh, Iowa and Nebraska, they're, they're growing, but not as fast and not nearly as high. So we see that uh, basically you're, and, and why is there why is there more negotiated sales in Iowa than there are in Texas and Kansas? Farmer feeders, right? Independent feeders. They 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 uh they don't have as close ties with the packer, so the packer treats them like stepchildren. But these are the guys that used to call our office in St. Joe, and they'd say, well, I've got a pin of fats ready. I haven't had a pin ready for six months. What are cattle bringing right now? That's where they're at. They don't have a clue. They couldn't have told you before they called within 10 bucks a hundred where they ought to start pricing their cattle. Packers love it. Absolutely love it. Your cash market is established by Iowa every week. In, in, in parts of Nebraska. They're the ones that start selling cattle. They're the least armed to do it. I don't know how many of you know Iowa regions, but you wouldn't leave your, your fortune up to them for the most part. But uh, they do have old money and lots of land. But they, they're the ones that start trading the cattle every week. And, and that one price, and it's split a little bit now because the North is getting a premium, but that one price you get for cash fat cattle every week, it's so important. Everything is based off of that. Your futures are based off of it. All your formulas are based off of it. Your yearling prices are based off of it. Your calf prices are based off of it. What you guys get paid, everything is based off of that. And then you think, well, most of your cattle feeders are just working off the basis because they hedge all their cattle, right? All they worry about is the difference between the futures and the cash price whenever their cattle are finished. That's where they make their living. But cow-calf producers have to have real money. You got to make tractor payments. You got, you got land rent. You got uh, shoes for your kids. You got to pay. You got to have real money. You can't just work off the basis all the time and, and how much uh, percentage interest you have in your operation. So it makes it really tough. Average cash steers. This is the difference between cash steer prices and box speed prices. Yes. Five minutes is all I got? Okay. We're getting on pretty close here. All right. And you look at how uh, box speed cutout values and your steer prices hung really close together until all of a sudden they started drifting apart. And at this point is whenever your packers started really cashing in and, and your cattle feeders and cattle producers started missing out. So what I'm telling you is the Cowboys are no match for the backers. We cannot win. They've got home field advantage. They've got all the plays. They've got our playbook. I mean, they, they run the show. This is your, your uh, JBS buyer right here. He gets very excited every week. Okay, I want to talk to you about some black swans. Okay, this is August 9th, 2019. What is this? This is a fire of Finney County, right? Okay, so that fire happened. What happened shortly after that fire? Okay, here is August, two, August uh, 9th, 2019. That's box speed cutout values. They went up 20 some dollars a hundred. Your fat cattle price went down one to two dollars. How come every time we have a, a disaster, a black swan, your packers benefit and your cattle people are left holding in the back? So we thought since we lost the 6,500 head a day plant that we weren't going to be able to process our, our cattle anymore because everybody, including cattle packs, have told us that we were at 100% of capacity. Yeah, right. So even though we lost the 6,500 head a day plant, 
our, our, our uh, slaughter went up every week, week after week after week. How the heck can we do the slaughter? Yeah, yeah, they can turn the chains up a little bit on those. But anyways, we see that. There's a lot of uh, things that can be said about that, but uh, it, that's kind of the way that goes. How about the pandemic? You know, we don't know whether it escaped the laboratory or it came from uh, folks eating their rats, uh, medium rare instead of medium well. But uh, the, the, the fire, that was nothing compared to this. They went up 20 bucks a hundred. They, you know, went 200 bucks a hundred. Look at this. Who's left holding the bag again? Your cattle feeders. I talk about transfer of ownership. Well, basically, uh, you know, half of our big four are owned by Brazilians, and, uh, and it's all getting concentrated. We're losing our regional packers, which is terrible. Uh, I want to talk about this. These are the things that we do every day as cattle producers, right? So it's sometimes cold and hot, sometimes it's hard work, but that's the way we choose to live our lives and raise our families. Over here, it doesn't look like much fun, does it? I always say that, that the miniseries Lonesome Dove wouldn't have been nearly as popular if Gustus McCray and Jack Paul had been running a confinement hog operation. <laughs> it's just not very romantic. You don't get to travel, you don't have any interaction with call girls or anything. It's not much fun. That's where we're headed, folks. We got reason for concern here. Uh, anybody know what that is? That's the logo for Beyond Meat's Fake Meat Company. Okay, they have a, a mission statement. Their mission statement is to eliminate farm animals from protein production. Not curb around the edge, but eliminate it. So if your mission statement is to eliminate farm animals from protein production, why would you put a steer head as your logo and then dress it in drag just to piss us off? <laughs> That's exactly why they do it. They go for the throat. That's why they get a, a world champion uh, uh, Bulldogger's brother to get on the, the Burger King commercial and eat a burger and say, well, I'm a damn fool for raising cattle. That's why they do it. Last thing I'm going to talk about is these are the guys that are, are the coolest guys who are in the cowboy stuff, right? So you guys know the Duke and Clint Eastwood. How about this guy up here? That's Robert C. Atkins. He invented the Atkins diet. Where he eats steak and eggs for every meal and he gets smaller. It was fantastic. He's almost solely responsible for turning our, our beef consumption around and, and, and getting it to come back. And he's passed on and then his, his diet kind of went out of favor, but it's come back now as what? The keto diet. The keto diet's even better because they have a different way of doing it. They give you supplements to kind of keep you off the pot when that ketosis sets in. <laughs> This guy down here is Memphis Charlie McVean. He is solely responsible for your price you got in 2014. So in 2014, back in 2012 and 2013, Memphis Charlie, he handled risk management for most of your big feeders. He saw there was an opportunity there. We had lower numbers of cows than we'd had for many years, similar to now because of droughts. And he saw that uh, we had twice as many people as we did in the 1950s, but less cows. So he started he started buying your live cattle features. He started buying them. He used all the limits he had. He used all the limits that his customers had. And finally, what he did, which was against the rules, was he started finding other people that had limits, and he started buying them to long the cattle market. He did that, and he ran your fat cow market up to 172. You guys were selling calves for three dollars and something a pound, and then finally uh, the bubble finally burst, and the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation come in and said, "Hey, we saw what you did." And he said, uh, "What are you going to do about it?" And he said, "Find you five million dollars." And he said, "Let me just write you a check." <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, some guys will tell you that uh, the crash of 2015 was because we got rid of country awards and labeling. The crash of 2015 came because that bubble finally burst and we got down to the bottom. But uh, I'm going to finish up my presentation right there because I'm out of time and I'm not going to take a question or two. So appreciate you guys for listening. We've got time for any questions.